Okay, welcome to those who are joining as we will we'll get started here in a couple minutes. Let everybody trickle in. Start a couple couple minutes after the after the top of the hour. For those just joining, we are going to give it a couple more minutes as everybody else is trickling in. Welcome. All right, why don't we go ahead and get started? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome. Um, as many of you already know, my name is Alex Cron, and I am BPOC's Digital Operations and Collections Information Analyst. We are back with another episode of Dreaming of Dam. Today we have David Newberry, the Assistant Director of Software and User Experience at the Getty, joining us to talk about the Getty's Art Collection Reboot. Now, before I go ahead and introduce David, um, I do want to mention that we ask that you put any questions that you have in the Q&A section. Please feel free to use um, the chat for comments or discussion. Um, if you need captioning, you may use the Zoom captioning or we have Otter AI uh, live streaming services up in the upper left hand corner. Now I'll go ahead and introduce David. Uh, David works with cultural heritage professionals, researchers, scientists, and technologists to find common solutions to technical and scholarly problems. In this capacity, he leads the team responsible for public-facing software, APIs, and research applications such as the Getty Vocabularies and the Getty Museum Collection. Previous projects include Art Tracks, a provenance uh, project at the Carnegie Museum of Art, and the American Art Collaborative, working with 14 museums on standardizing models and software around linked data. He has previously worked with Carnegie Mellon, the University of British Columbia, University of Illinois, and PBS. David is also the current president of MCN and on the executive committee for the IIIF uh, Consortium. Now I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you, David. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Nick and Alex, for inviting me to talk about the work we've done. Um, and as Alex said, I'm David Newbury. I'm here on behalf of Getty, and I'm here really representing the work of a really of a team of people who are who built this. Um, I'm the lucky person who gets to talk about the hard work done by many other people in the organization. So um, to get this started, I wanted to show this slide. Um, because I feel like every time I give a presentation about museums, it's about JSON, linked data, IIIF, APIs, the data nerdery behind this kind of work. Um, it's actually really nice because um, 
those of you who were at the last one at Newfields heard a lot about this sort of technology and the work that they're doing. And I feel like I can just say, go watch that presentation. The thing that they're talking about doing is the same sort of thing we're doing. And it felt a little redundant to go and say um, the same thing that they just said. So I'm happy to talk about some of the data underpinnings on what we're doing during the question section, if anyone is interested. Um, but we are using those same technologies that many of our peers across the field are using. Um, they're really, really good, and it helps build that sense of standardization across the organization. But I didn't think that would be the most useful thing for me to talk about here. And so what I'm really interested in sharing is some of what we did, but also why we did it. Because I think that's a lot of the most interesting stuff behind the kind of work that we do. So we started what we've called Collection Online 2.0 to really talk about redesigning the Getty Museum collection pages. And so this is what they looked like before we started. And um, we have, uh, we often refer to these as our 1998 design. Um, they're not, they were really cool when they came out and then we spent a very long time resting on those laurels. And by the time we said, this doesn't really reflect our organization, uh, they were quite long in the tooth. And so in 2022, after a couple of years of work, we redesigned it. Uh, we were building on some brand work that we'd done. Um, and we really said, this is who we think we look like now. This is the kind of work we want to be showing off. Um, there's a new design. And we really thought a lot about the functionality for the audiences that we wanted to serve. And I'll talk more about audience later on. Um, but beyond the individual object pages, we also really wanted to focus on the ecosystem of data that surrounds our objects and to say there's more than just an object-centric perspective of our work. Um, the places that those are hanging is part of the story of this object. That's really important. The people who participated in the artwork and its life are really important, both the artists and the previous owners. Um, the people, because Artworks live inside a social network of things. And what we're talking about increasingly is not just artworks as artwork, but artworks and how they intersect with the social things that we do. Uh, we also thought a lot about search. Um, previously, we had something that felt very much like Amazon, you know, your advanced search with the 20 different facets that you can filter on. And behind the scenes, with the linked data work we did, with the wonderful work of our catalogers, we realized we had about 60 facets that we could be showing. Um, and that's overwhelmingly complicated for any person who might want to be searching across this. Um, we also went to our analytics and realized about 1%, maybe 2% of the people using our search ever did anything beyond a keyword search. Um, we also realized a significant percentage of those people work at the Getty. Um, so our staff uses this, there are researchers who use this, but it wasn't meeting those needs and how could we make search simpler and easier for people to use without losing that ability for scholars to find the thing that they're wanting. Um, but as I said, when we were doing this, what we really wanted to make sure we thought about was who are the people who use our website and what are they trying to do? And so we did some research and it was nice because this is not the first time anyone's ever redone a collection website. Um, there, this is probably not the first time someone's done a third version of the collection website. There are 20, 30 years of research out there that talk about what people do with museum collections. Um, so we did some of our own independent research, but we did a lot more cribbing off of all y'all who have done this research before and published it and shared it out. Um, to understand what people were doing and then just confirm that research given our specific audience. And what we learned, which is probably not a surprise to those of you in the field, is the, the core audience for a museum collection site are people who come to these pages to do their job. Um, they're getting paid to look at websites. Some of these are art historians, some of them are fellow museum professionals, some of them are teachers. They're a research information seeking audience, and they're, they're doing specific tasks related to our collections, such as answering questions or obtaining images. Um, that's the majority of people who attend or use our website in this particular place. The second core audience we had were what we call reusers, people who want images. Um, often these are practicing artists. 
Um, these are people looking for publications. Um, but what they don't really care about the information. They want a picture. And sometimes they want a specific picture of a specific artwork, but even more commonly, they want a nice picture. Um, and that was really important because they're reusing it for their own creative or intellectual pursuits. The third audience is what we talked about as the art enthusiast. Um, these people come to our website almost never through our website. There's a social media post or a blog post or a news article or a Google search that gets them to here and we're that place they go to learn more about that object. And finally, um, our own staff is a major user of this website and it was important to think about what they wanted to do for this. Um, and those, those audiences are ranked both in how much we think they are a part of the audience, but also how important we thought they were for the use of this website. And we also said, why are we building this website? What do we want to do with it? Um, and goal number one is, there's a lot of stuff we know about our objects, and we're the only place that you will find that information. That's part of the job of being a museum is to really represent that knowledge. So we're that central place for knowledge. Um, it had to look nice. We're a museum. We care a lot about our aesthetics. If you've ever come to the Getty, it's a beautiful place. The museum had the website had to match that to be a represent uh, a representative of what we do, part of our brand. Um, we said one of the things we really wanted to do here was improve that access for high quality images. We knew it was how, what people wanted to do with it. We had been very early in sort of the open content, open sharing of images world, um, but that meant that we had a very sort of clunky way you got to it. I mean, we could make that better. Um, we wanted to do a lot of work around complex objects. One of the messiest things about a art collection is um, everything we have in our museum is a unique, interesting object with an interesting story. Um, what that means is that it's a whole 100,000 snowflakes, all with their own weirdnesses and complexities. Um, and often trying to build an interface lets you show a painting, an illustrated manuscript, a tea set, and you know, 75 broken curls off the, off the statue, all in the same sort of thing, was one of the major challenges we knew we had to deal with. And finally, we wanted to help users find interesting and relevant information. We know people are going here to find that, to answer questions. Helping them find that was really important. And so we thought about what we'd use to as success metrics for doing that, um, because um, we wanted to convince people that what we were doing was making a difference, and we wanted to have a way to judge whether or not the changes we were making were successful. So we said, let's track how many people download images. We know what they've been doing over the past five years. We can see, can, does that number go up? Did we meet that need? Um, we also said, how often do people leave our collection page without following a link? Because you got here, and that wasn't necessarily a bad thing. Right, Because if we found the information that you wanted, great, you're done. You can go and do your job. But we knew there were people who were going to come here and we wanted them to go to something related. Um, these this is to help identify and see if we're meeting the needs of people who were browsing through the site, looking for things that they found interesting. So we wanted to track that and see if we were meeting that need. And also, we wanted to track how often you left our page for another information resource, um, either on our website or even more often off our website. Because I don't know about your museums, but we don't sell ads. I've got no real desire to keep you on the Getty website. Um, it doesn't benefit me. My goal here is to help you find information that you find interesting. And if it turns out that's at another museum, or that's on a different website, or we can help you get to that source of information. We're doing our job, even if we don't have the answer to that question. So that was something we're tracking, is how often we leave for things outside of collection online, because that's something, then we are doing that job the way we wanted to do it. And finally, we said, we don't care about page views. Nothing we're doing in the redesign is going to make people come to the museum collection more, um, and tracking that sets up a bunch of um, unintended consequences. 
Trying to make that number go up means we do things like make it harder to find information, make you jump through more hoops to get to things. Um, it didn't build any benefit to what we were doing. And so we said, we're not even going to talk about that. We're not going to show it. It's not going to be part of our communication because it sets up the wrong incentives for what we want to do. We want to help people meet their jobs, not come to our website. The other thing that we thought was really important is we did some looking into how do people find our collection? And for that enthusiast audience, we realized people come through many, many, many different paths through you know, weird things we do online, through our exhibitions, through our news, um, from our audio guide, from Google, um, from Google Arts and Culture, from social media, from search engines. These are people who are typically looking for discovery they're curious and they come to our website in through those doors. Um, and we really, you know, that's an audience we wanna serve, but even more, we wanna serve the needs of those other places because we were finding that our, when we were writing stories on the Getty blog, um, people were feeling like they had to do a lot of describing of objects. And we can say, we can be that deep dive. You don't have to do it there. Social media is always showcasing artworks. Our job is to be the place that when you're done showcasing and you want to send them somewhere to learn more about it, we can be that place. Uh, professional audiences came in from different ways. They often knew what they were looking for. They would come through Google, but they would also come through things like lesson plans and projects. And so our job was to really provide a way for this ecosystem of ways that people talk about the collection into the object rather than try to redo the job that all these other sources were having. And so we don't do a lot of storytelling in our collection um, because we often find that people do a better job of telling stories when it's not tied to a single object. Instead, it's tied to you know, connections between objects or connections to histories or stories about your life. We can meet that need. We don't have to do it on the collection. This is a place that provides that deep um, dive and then also sends you off to other places. And that deep dive was really important because we did find this as being a really regular thing that we did. And we couldn't tell stories the way we wanted to on the individual collection pages because they were about connections and um, places between things. Um, but we also knew that this website had to meet this access to critical knowledge. We know stuff like the provenance of our objects that don't exist other places. Um, and we felt this was really one of those tensions between on the website is we had these people who wanted high level information or access to artwork and we had these deep dives and we wanted to help them find those answers. And how do we do both of those on that same page? And this is not a new problem or a new insight. Um, we did our best to solve it the way that we knew how to solve it. And finally, this is one of the things that we added to the website that wasn't present before, which is just at the very bottom, we have a list of lots and lots of links to other things. And it's both links to like the IIIF manifest, which if you know what that is, it's super useful. If you don't, it's at the bottom of the page and you can ignore it. But it's also things like the TMS ID, um, which is absolutely useless if you don't work at the Getty. But if you do work at the Getty, being able to go from the collection back to TMS really quickly was really, really important. Um, so this was, you know, all of these things are, you know, this is not the most glamorous part of the page, but it's often the most used part of the page. So, you know, we wanted to track, did we do it? And, you know, one of the benefits is we did launch a website. It does come out. It does look better. It does work better. Um, but one of the other things we really wanted to do is Getty is maybe not unique, but has this thing where we are building other digital properties as part of this ecosystem that we're building. Um, we have a really big archive. And so one of the things we did in our technical thing is say, when we start building out these sections, it has to feel part of a larger digital ecosystem, not off on its own. And so there's a search here, but it needs to mirror the way you search the archive. So it can't be one-to-one -one because archives and museum collections are different, but it had to feel like it was part of the same ecosystem. And even more, it had to be sustainable because we don't have a big enough team to have a archives team and a collection team and a vocab team 
and all of these different systems. So we built it around a design system of tools that we reuse across many, many components in our site. And that was really important because it helped us do more with the same amount of resources, which was a really important thing for what we were trying to do. Uh, we also put a lot of work into direct download of images. Um, you know, this is something we've seen on other websites. It wasn't a cool idea, but it was, I would say, one of the big political challenges here is helping people understand the implications of that and trying to find that balance between facilitating what we knew was a real need of people wanting high quality images and the intricacies of copyright and rights. And so one of the things that we pulled off on this that I'm really proud of is that we moved from our own license to Creative Commons licenses, because that it didn't change what anyone could do and it didn't change any of the rights, but it made the communication about what you could do a little easier for people. Um, and that was really important. Uh, we also were trying to figure out what do people wanna do once they've reused it and things like putting a caption that you can just copy directly, really help people feel comfortable about the reuse of it in a way that, you know, let people take these images, do what they wanted, and then use it appropriately downstream. Um, we also added into the website, underneath the images in that top level description, this thing that we call more from the collection. Um, and this serves a couple feature, a couple functions on our website. Um, one of them is up at the top, you have the image, you have the download, you have the little blurb. That's enough for someone who wants to get a deeper dive, sort of understand this object a bit more, some information. Below this section is exhibition history and object metadata and bibliography and provenance and all of the really deep information for information seekers. And so one of the goals of this section was to give people an off-ramp because if you scroll down a little bit more on this page, you start getting into information. And we wanted to say, if what you're looking for are interesting things to do, you can jump off here. You can go see something else cool. You don't have to read everything on the page. And so we thought about this a lot as our, I think I said it again, the off-ramp for enthusiasts to go into other things they found and for professionals to get past into the information they actually care about. Um, we made... One of the things that we really workshopped a lot was what do we call this thing? Originally, I think we called it, I mean, internally we called it the Netflix box, but we couldn't put that on the website. Um, we talked about it for a while as, you know, suggestions or recommendations. And what we realized as we started using it is we didn't want to do that because it was pulling up things that maybe you didn't want to see. Um, we're in our museum, we've got a ton of stuff. Um, at one point, one of our developers was looking at artwork and came across photography of, you know, of Nazis. And we're like, we don't ever want to be at a place where we're saying, you know, what we think you want to see are more Nazis. Uh, but they are part of our collection and we didn't feel like it was appropriate to try to filter them out. We also had no idea what our criteria for filtering them out would be. Like, you know, they're all part of our collection. And so that was really important. Um, and the other thing we did is we said, the goal of this section is to help people find things that they think are interesting, and we don't yet know what that is. I mean, I don't have a, a recommendation engine like Netflix does that tracks your history and knows what you like. Um, we don't track people that way, and even if I did, I'm not sure I'd have the sophistication to build that. So what we did is each of these six blocks uses a different algorithm to track um, to try to find something that you might find interesting. Because when we talked about this, we said, it turns out we're gonna show you six things and you have to find one of them interesting. And if any one of these is interesting, we've done our job. It doesn't have to be six things you like because you're not gonna click six links. You're gonna click one of them. Um, and so we did one where it was about the materiality. You know, Photographs show you other photographs. Um, works on canvas, other works on canvas. Bronzes, other bronzes. Um, we did some work around color analysis of all these objects. It's sort of a, the first step in our using computers to analyze artwork, because palettes are pretty easy thing to pull. But what it meant is we could find things that had similar colors. Because we also knew a lot of what people find inspiring is the way things look and feel, and color is an approachable proxy for that kind of work. Um, and so we used 
either material in color or culture in color to help find other things that you might find attractive. If you're looking at you know, floral things, this will pull up other floral things because the colors are often similar. Um, we use classification and color in time period. Maybe you're interested in, you know, um, maybe you're interested in illustrated manuscripts. This will pull up things that look similar to that from a similar time period. Um, and what we found here is one of the things that we wanted to do here is it was really easy given our collection to either fall into the photography rabbit hole or to fall into the pottery shard rabbit hole. Because like most of us, you know, we've got we've got great paintings, but we've only got a couple hundred great paintings. We have about a hundred thousand photographs. And so a lot of the what we were looking for here were ways to find recommendations that would pull you out of what you were already looking at, things you might find interesting, but that weren't tightly coupled to what you were doing. I will also say this is the single most controversial thing we added to the website, um, particularly internally, because it, it, it works, I will say. Like the metrics of people, whether or not people click on these, uh, we track, it gets a lot of use. The amount of, you know, of people using these things to go to find interesting artwork and follow that rabbit hole of interesting things that you find, people do it. And it's really, really successful. Um, but we work in an organization of people who really like to tell stories and who know a ton about the arts. And so when a curator looks at this, they're trying, they aren't looking for like, is there something cool I'm looking at here that I might want to click on? They're trying to make a story out of this because that's their job and that's what they do. And there is no story. I mean, it's, you know, six little algorithms that pull related things together. And so I think a lot of what we've been trying to do in this um, work is help people realize that we're meeting the needs of various audiences. And those audiences are often different than you are. Um, building a museum collection site for museum professionals is a really different project than building it for people who want to use a museum collection. And so we spend a lot of our time talk, you know, communicating and explaining and showing and tracking that this is doing what it's supposed to be doing, even if it doesn't work the way that it, you would want it to work given your needs. Um, and so, so much of the work of building a museum collection is not that technical work of engineering, even though there's a lot of that that goes in. It is the work of communicating the why is you're doing this and the impact that it's having um, to people who are really good at understanding how museums work in the physical space and less so in the way that people use websites these days. Um, and as I said, we did track all of these things. Um, there, we tracked, you know, how many people went to the related work. We had some baselines, we had some goals, we tracked whether or not we were meeting those goals, um, whether or not people went to related works was, you know, we, that was something we weren't tracking before, but we were sending people, this is those clicks into other information sources. We thought maybe 300 a month would be a good goal. We were getting about 400 a month, that was great. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, no, that was clicks on that related block. Outbound links, how often people went to find new information on these websites. We were having about 500 people click on links beforehand. We were hoping we could make that go up by 50%. We went to 13,000 of those a month. We were, it turns out this is something people actually want to do, and it was incredibly successful to send people out to other sources for information, because which isn't surprising since we knew information seeking behavior was the thing people came to our website to do, but making it possible for people to go and find those, highlighting the availability of that really was significantly more successful than we thought it would be. Um, bounce rate, how often people dead ended on our site was something we did care about. We went from 80% of the people ending on our page to 45. This is where that you know recirculation, giving people things to look at, really went up. Um, the people who were coming were coming and either getting the information they needed or getting to somewhere interesting. Um, and we added about 50% more downloads of our open content images. And again, traffic didn't radically change. So this isn't just more people coming. The work of making it easier for people to get this improved the number of people who were doing it 
And so we're meeting another 10,000 people a year's need or 10,000 downloads in need in a, a month that we weren't meeting before. And so this was, this is important both because it turns out if you don't track something, um, you don't know whether or not any of the changes you made had the impact you wanted them to. And what I what I told my team and what I told my my bosses was I don't really care if we meet our goals with this. What's important is that we have goals and we check, because having goals and then checking about whether or not we were successful in them, if we weren't successful, that meant our our idea of how we were going to do it didn't work, and we could try something new. Um, but otherwise, it's just did I like it, and that's a terrible metric for whether or not you're meeting people's needs. And so. What comes next for us here, um, this was a major project we did. And we finished it you know, 18 months ago, 12 months ago. Um, but the most important thing we've been talking about now is we didn't build our, we didn't do a project to redesign the collection pages. That was part of it. But now we have a product. We have a thing that is not done. I'm not sure we can ever get it to done. Uh, it's something that we have to keep thinking about you know, what are those things that we could do to make it better? How does it continue to meet needs, both new user needs or ones we didn't meet, but also the way the organization is changing? And so one of the things that we really want to do, and this will be one of our projects over the next year, is to really think about how exhibitions play into this. It's in parallel with rethinking how we promote exhibitions at the Getty, but capturing that scholarship that goes into an exhibition and saying, when an exhibition closes, what do we keep around for it? to preserve that information in the long term for scholars, because it's a need. It's not the same need as promoting the exhibition. But how do we make that part of the ecosystem of what we do is really important to us. You know, this is where, you know, we could maybe capture wall labels from an exhibition. This is where that, you know, links back to the catalog, links to the recordings of the events that happen as part of that exhibition. But give us a hub for, um, Capturing the information about how these are used in the context of being a museum feels really important. So that's a major area of work for us in the next year. And the other one is really working on improving some of the data. Um, particularly, we think for accessibility, working on visual descriptions of our images is really important. Um, that's a major piece of work. We've got you know, a couple hundred thousand images that need that sort of descriptive work. And so how do we do that effectively is, you know, something we're queuing up, as well as work around subject tagging. Um, it's really interesting if you look at our search, because in the top five or top 10 search results, we have cat, we have dog. Um, and it turns out we don't, if it's not in the title, we don't have anywhere for you to find pictures of cats. That's a real need. How do we do that? And not in sort of like the, iconography style of like, this is a picture of St. Sebastian, because those people can find that information. Um, it's all of the, you know, the couple hundred things that normal people search for when they're looking for pictures to meet that reuse need. Um, and so we've been in conversation with a lot of other colleagues in the, organ in the field who are doing this kind of work to say, what are those search terms and how can we sort of build a common set of, these are the things that people use to look for. Um, and finally, improving the reconciliation that we do. Um, we have, for instance, these really amazing bibliographies where we track all of the times people reference our artwork and our curators put a lot of time into maintaining these lists. Getty has a really good library as well in which most of these volumes appear. Um, but we haven't done the data work to say, this bibliography entry is this book in our library? Wouldn't you like to go and see that book? I mean, it's not, you know, it's it's work. It's, you know, labor and judgment because there's you can't just run, there's no algorithm I know of that can find all of these things. Um, but building that helps us do that work of helping people find new sources of information. So that's really critical. Another area here is we do a good job of recording places. Um, Getty also has a really amazing, you know, the source of geographic names. Um, but we need to do that work of reconciling between those two data sets to help find that, those connections, because that'll open up more opportunities to help people find information and also tell the story of 
how this object relates to other objects in the collection in a better way. And finally, the data improvement that I want that I did list here is we tell stories of our artwork every day in the organization. We do it through blog posts. We do it through lectures. We do it through tours. We create information resources outside of this, but we don't connect those well back in and make those links between the blog post and the object really visible. And so how do we make that possible to build those connections between intellectual work we're doing as a as a museum and the objects that exist within the museum? Um, and it's not a hard technical problem. It's a hard social problem because you have to make it easy enough for the people who are doing their job to create that, to make those connections between things. Um, and we've tried it a couple of ways and none of them have been easy enough to actually get used. So having a technical capacity that no one's willing to do to add the data in doesn't meet the need. And so one of our challenges the next year is how do we accommodate that in a way that helps people help us tell the story of the work they're doing and build those connections. So thank you. That's sort of an overview of the why, much less than the what or the, the nerdery underneath of it. Um, but I'm really interested in hearing questions and trying to answer anything I can about what we've done here. Yeah, thank you, David, for that excellent presentation. I especially appreciate the KPI dashboard. Um, let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, we have one already um, from Brendan. Can you give an example of where those outbound links are displayed within the collection, which are most commonly clicked? Um, some of the bibli a lot of them are in that bibliography section. Um, the ones I was showing are text links because they're older in that particular list. But as you go down, they tend to be links out to online resources that are part of that bibliography. Those get a lot of clicks through. Um, the other places, often the exhibition histories that we do have, because um, we're often linking out to other institutions that have that information. Um, probably the third one is the we have links from people um, back to the vocabularies to learn more about it. There's additional information there. Um, this is an area where, again, I would love there to be more links, particularly to really good information resources about an artwork or a person or an exhibition. Um, the problem is building tools that let our staff capture that knowledge because they know it. Um, how do I get it out of the head of the curator who knows all of this stuff onto the website? Because there's not really, it's not like they're going to go into TMS and do that data entry. It has to be something where it's mutually beneficial. Great, thank you. Um, so we have another question from Joe. Have you used a standard CMS or is this a bespoke system you've built yourself? B. The website itself is um, custom code. It's a view through view application, you know, with the Python and Elasticsearch backend. Um, the data is coming out of TMS um, for most of it, and some other sources like our dams for other bits of the information. Um, we run it through the pull out of TMS, transform it into linked art, create an API for it, pipeline that I think. New fields described well last time. Um, and the third part is we ended up realizing there's a lot of pieces of content that you end up here, things like the description of an artwork or description of an artist or description of a gallery. And TMS is a really lousy place to write long form text. And so we've linked that back into our content management system for the website, which is a headless tool called Content Stack. Um, and so we're pulling a lot of the work we do and the engineering team behind the scenes is doing is building that way to take data from the sources where people are already working and link them together so that API record isn't just a TMS API, it's an object API. A lot of what we're doing is transforming from our view, which is, you know, there's registrarial information in TMS and there's image and rights data in the dams and there's content in the content management system and transforming the way that someone outside would see the object. So if I think about the work our APIs are doing, it's that transform from the staff viewpoint of our 
data infrastructure to the public's view of our data infrastructure. We have a follow-up question from Joe. <laughs> How often are people using the APIs and other identifiers? I know I know Google Arts and Cultures is using it to harvest it and feed that thing. I know our audio guide vendor is using it to feed that data. Um, I have no idea. I don't actually track how often who is using our APIs. Um, I would love all of you to be using it. Um, and if you're using it, please do tell me so I can answer that question better. Um, but it's being used a little bit. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's one of those hard, like, I don't want to make people log in and use to use our data. The whole point of it is to make it public, but it doesn't mean it's really hard to know how it's being used out in the world. All right. Uh, we have a, a question from Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Uh, what did you find to be the most impactful arguments or resources when proposing strategic changes like the move to direct download? I have found the most useful argument is to find somebody that those people respect who are already doing it and say, we're just, this is not scary. So for direct download, I think we cribbed off. We were like, look, the Met's allowing people to do this. Clearly they know what they're doing so isn't scary. Um, and so that sort of lowers the, this is a risky thing downstream. Um, I know I've, I have had that conversation with other people's bosses around things like publishing provenance because Getty's done that for a while. And I can go and say, look, we've done it for five, six, seven years now. We haven't gotten sued. It's been beneficial to scholars. This isn't a risky thing to do. And so that being part of that community and letting your peers help make the case for you has been really impactful. Um, the, I mean, I think that had the biggest effect because my sense is that people just wanna know that you're not doing something dumb. Um, and no amount of me being like, here's the academic paper that demonstrates why people are going to do this helped. It was really useful to have all of that data because I could go and say, look, we've done our research, we've done it. But no one's gonna read that. What they're really, it is that fear of change and fear that it's going to reflect on, you know, and this may be my institution, but that fear of this is gonna reflect poorly on our reputation was really important. We're lucky that there wasn't a revenue quest around things like that. Um, it's not how Getty rolls. Um, and so I think that if we had, we're in a place where we're arguing about impact of things like ticket sales or revenue, I would need more concrete numbers. But for us, that was really what we were trying to solve. We're getting some really great questions. Um, next question from Brendan. Are any of these TMS data transformations available as open source? Let me answer that in two ways. One is we've put a lot of time and energy into building out a tool that we call our link data gateway or an LOD gateway that we're working to make open source. Um, and we hope to in a couple months, once I can actually get the documentation to a point where someone could run it without having to call us. Um, but that's just a tool that lets you create the APIs, not do the transformations themselves. Um, I am happy to share the knowledge that we have in those transformations. I don't know that anyone would find it useful because having worked in a couple or with organizations using TMS in different ways, our TMS data is nothing like your TMS data. Um, the, the technique we're using is we have asked our reasonably sophisticated TMS super user to create a view for us of the data that they want to make public because our biggest concern in dealing with this was TMS has things like the title and the accession number that are really valuable for the public to know. They also have things like the insurance value and the current physical location, which we don't want anyone to ever be able to get to on our website. 
And I didn't even want the possibility of sharing that information out with people. And so we worked with them to say, create a view, anything you put in this view, we need to be willing to make public so we can share that back out. Um, I, you know, that's a, that's so custom to our world that sharing it wouldn't be helpful. Sharing the, here's our Python transformation code running in our specific task runner against our specific API endpoints would also not be helpful. So open source may not be the right model there, but building off the expertise we've done and sharing that out with the community is really important. And so that's part of why I'm giving this presentation. If people are trying to do this kind of work and want to bounce ideas off people who have done it before, reach out to me or people on my team. I'd love to help other people do this work. I'm just not sure that sharing code is the right way to do that. Thank you, David. Uh, next question. Are the IIIF images served directly from your dams or do you do some transformation first? The they come out of the dams and we use Open Text Media Manager. Um, and we do, we transform them into pyramidal TIFFs and we serve that out through IIP image. Uh, partially because our dams, uh, for a very, very brief window, we considered going directly to the dams. And then we realized that what that means is anytime an image gets popular, all that comes from the dams. And then we take the dams down and then all of our staff gets really angry because they can't do their job anymore. Um, and so we, we move everything out to a cache. We do this for TMS as well. We do it for all of our systems because um, nobody whose job it is to work in those internal staff facing systems is happy when the answer is, oh, I'm sorry, we accidentally used too much of the information and now you can't do your job. Um, and so we pull it out, we transform it. There's also a lot of rights level stuff that has to go into that because we do have contemporary photography that we can't share at the same way. And so a lot of what we're doing there is a, is in that kind of transformation. And if you're interested, um, we actually have a, published a web paper, a white paper on our website around the research we did around our IIIF system. Um, some of it is around and certain analysis of IIIF servers. Some of it is around image compression formats. So if you want to really deep dive into how that works, we've got that available, and I can share a link with you, Alex, afterwards. Perfect. Thank you. And any links that David shares with me, I will also include in our upload to our YouTube channel as well. Um, all right. Next question we have from Joe um, related to IIIF. Do you exploit annotations at all in relation to the IIIF content? Today, we do that with the palettes, so uh, and but the color palettes. Those are all done as annotations and live in our AAA ecosystem. Um, that is an area that we are just beginning to open, and part of it is that we need a better viewer on that web page if we're going to start showing annotations to users. Um, we're using mostly open sea dragon and that doesn't really show annotations well but even more most of the annotations we're going to create in our ecosystem are going to come out of things like machine learning or computer vision things like you know bounding boxes of faces or ocr of words and showing those directly to users as annotations gets incredibly overwhelming you know it's and distracts from the looking at the artwork thing we want you to be doing. And so, yes, we're going to be using annotations. A lot of what we're trying to do is figure out how to manage a wealth of annotations, um, because as soon as we open that box, there's going to be more available than we know what to do. with. And how do we keep it from overwhelming people is, I think, um, one of our big challenges. And I think one of the challenges of our collection pages going forward, between what the registrars and curators put in, what we can pull from external sources, what we can generate with computational tools. We already know probably more than anyone is willing to read on a page. And we've just begun to open up the possibility of what we could show. I mean, I tell people all the time, we've digitized 
like 50 or 60,000 books as part of our library digitization process. And we have the tools to do name entity recognition and pull every mention of every artwork in our collection from all of those books and link them back. And I don't think that serves any need for people because it's going to end up with huge amounts of links, many of which will either be bad data or just irrelevant trivia. And so I think, you know, how do we make sure that the links we're providing are contextual and help people answer questions and aren't just showing off that we know a lot of things is part of, I think, the challenge going forward. Hey, um, we have another question from Brendan. Can you tell us again the name of the existing research you use to help understand, uh, um, help understand audience? I'm not sure the transcript included it or I can't find it. A link would be great if it's available. Um, I, yes, I will share that out. I am, I will say we, on my like long list of things that we're doing in the tidying up of this is consolidating all of that into a little white paper presentation. So we have, you know, Google Docs with, you know, 30 or 40 links and the environment scan and all of that. We're working to publish that out. It's just hasn't been done yet. Um, so I will, you know, look for that coming from the Getty in a reasonably short period of time. And we can always update our, our posting of this on YouTube to include that as well. Excellent. Um, we have another question from Joe. Uh, you mentioned before about not sharing location. Do you not even share which room the object is displayed in? Just curious about helping people find things when they're visiting. We absolutely show the object where um, in the location, if it is on view. Um, and it might be, I can probably just click over and show you that. Uh, let's see, is this one on view today? So it is on view. So we have a, here is what's, in, you know, on the object page, we show it's on view in this particular room. If you go there, you can both get a little map here of where that is in our space. And also, the other images, the other paintings that are on view alongside of it. Um, I will say this is one of the things that people have found most useful in our redesign that we weren't expecting. I mean, because this was data that had always been on there, but showing them all in context has been really valuable. Um, also, working with the team to pull together a description of what this gallery is. This is coming from our content management system. It's been really valuable as well. One of the challenges here is that it works with permanent collection stuff. We don't currently show any loan objects. And so it's a little, one of the caveats here is it's all the stuff that we own in this room. If there are loans next to it, we don't show that right now. And that's one of those challenges we'd really love to solve, balancing that rights issue with everything else. I love that map feature. <laughs> Um, all right, so that's it for questions from the audience right now. Um, while people are thinking or typing, um, I have a couple of questions for you myself. Mm -hmm. um, so you've shared what you've learned from this project, which I think is always such um, really an important point to cover in these webinars that we do. Can you talk a bit more about um, any roadblocks that you encountered um, during the project and, and what you found helpful in overcoming them? Um, one of the things that was a, maybe not a roadblock, that, but that we, we, that was a potential roadblock that we put a lot of energy into overcoming was to make sure that this didn't feel like it was coming from the digital team. This is a change in how the museum was presenting its objects. And so what we did is we put together, you know, we called it the governance group, but it was really a steering committee that had you know, someone from the collection data registrarial side. It had, you know, two curators, one from photography and one from antiquities, because those are sort of different. We have Getty has two museums. That was one from each. Alongside, you know, the TMS admin and something myself as the digital representative. And that group met regularly, mostly to make sure that we were meeting the strategic needs of 
that whole organization? Because this page, it's a web page, right? Like there's technology behind the scenes, but it's also represents curatorial and registrarial work. And that needed to be represented. And so having that group meet regularly, review all the documentation we were pulling together, and then be the communicators out to their spheres of expertise was incredibly valuable because it wasn't my project then. It was a project I was doing with peers. Um, and we gave so many presentations about this um, because it was the change management was harder than the technology work here. Um, and so, you know, that being willing to listen um, and also making sure that you knew, like the first thing we did was establish our audiences and our goals, um, because that gave us when people said, but I want you to do this thing. We could say, we all agreed and not David, but you, your peers that were delegated agreed that this is what we're trying to do. That's a really good idea, but it doesn't help us meet this set of needs. Um, and so that was really valuable to sort of work through those roadblocks. Um, I will say the other thing that we did is one of the goals we set we didn't meet, which was really to do a better job of visualizing some of the data through data visualizations. We put a lot of energy into a provenance visualization that didn't work um, because we weren't clear enough about the goals of what it would do. And so we built something and we showed it to people and it just didn't work. Um, and so both you know, it was, you have to be really clear on the problem you're trying to solve if you're going to solve a problem, um, particularly if you're trying to do something that hasn't been done before. Thank you. We had a couple more questions come in. Uh, how do you deal with uh, rehanging or moving objects in the gallery on collection pages and room pages? Do your users also understand what smaller displays are versus exhibitions? Um, we pull our data out of TMS nightly and update it. And so if things are moving, these pages get updated on a nightly basis, assuming that people actually put the data in TMS when they move things, uh, which they do because it that helps them track what they're doing. Um, I don't know that our users understand. Actually, I know our users don't understand the difference between rooms and exhibitions and small displays. Um, but I also know that I'm not sure that's the need this web page is serving, right? We show people that stuff in context because it's occasionally useful. But my sense is that people search for objects here and not try to understand the museum as a physical space. Um, and I will also say our online collection does not represent the museum as a physical space very well. I think I heard you, I think I said, you know, we've got 100,000 photography, you know, pieces of photography in our collection, and we have 400 paintings. Most of the paintings are on view and almost none of the photography is on view. And so our online collection looks nothing like our museum. Um, and that's been one of those things that we, we really are trying to help people understand that, you know, they meet different needs and they do different things. They're both true representations of the Getty, but they're different. So using this as a way to you know, try to recreate the physical experience of going to the museum is not a useful thing to do in my mind, because the best way you can see the museum is to go to the museum. All right, I think we have a couple minutes left, so I'll try and get these last two questions in. Uh, from Sherry, do you all have any objects with uh, many files, like many paged books or compound objects with multiple file types, image, video, sound, 3D? Uh, if so, what kind of usability challenges and solutions have you encountered with those? We absolutely have those kind of things. I do not have a solution to how to do it elegantly. Um, that I will say that's on our, we know it's one of the problems, it's better than it was. It's just really, it's a really, really hard challenge because it's unlike the way that people tend to think about navigating through stuff. And, you know, it's made hard because like we have illustrated manuscripts and many of those manuscript pages have been independently exhibited. And so each, each illustration has its own history and data separate from that of the book. 
And so this is one of these like, you know, we're going to keep working on it. If any of you come up with a really good solution for doing this, send it my way, because this is one of the big challenges that are unique to sort of the work we do in museums. All right, last question um, from Joe. Do you have dashboards or, or current goals slash KPIs uh, presentation for your internal stakeholders? If you do, do they get used a lot? Yes, we have a dashboard. I showed you that screenshot of it. I think I show it in presentations more to people outside of our museum more than anyone in the museum looks at. Um, we talked about whether it was important, and it turns out that, you know, I mean, none of our revenue, none of our exhibitions, we don't use that data. We use it to make sure on our end that we're doing what we think we should be doing and that our work is successful. Um, but our stakeholders, you know, at least the stakeholders that I work with are more interested in subjective measures and hearing from the people they talk to than looking at dashboards. Like, you know, the, the registrars care about open content downloads, but that's about it. So we've, we've spent a lot of time and energy across our time building dashboards for people. And it turns out that regularly talking to people about their concerns you know, I need the dashboard so I can answer their questions. But the people want, you know, are much more interested in conversations than in looking at websites that tell them data. Definitely. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time now. Thank you so much, David. Really appreciate your time today. This was such a fabulous presentation and all of the work that has gone into this project and sharing all of that with us and everyone attending today. Thank you everyone who joined and for asking such fabulous questions as well. Um, we will be taking a short summer hiatus on the webinar series while I make a cross country move to Virginia. If you are in the Virginia, DC, Maryland area, please reach out and connect. Um, and since it has been such a hot topic this year, we will be back in September to talk about AI. So stay tuned for more information on that. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day, wherever you are, and have a great rest of your week. Thanks, Thanks so much. Everyone. Really appreciate it. Take care. Bye.